All right, so we are going to talk about the Cross Plane Project. My name is Jared, I'm one of the creators of the project, and I have here my friend Mark, who has built multiple uh, platforms and control planes on uh, Cross Plane that are all running in production. So uh, you can consider him a bit of an expert on the topic as well. Um, as is usual for this session here, we always have a fairly diverse set of uh, folks in terms of level of experience and familiarity with Crossplane. So we're going to have you know, kind of something for everybody, really. So we're going to have, we have to start with some intro material for folks that don't really know what Crossplane is. But then after about 10 minutes or so, we're going to get into a little bit of a deeper dive. We're going to be showing off new features and new demos and stuff like that. So there will be something for everybody. But first, we've got to start with the basics. So for folks that don't know, Crossplane, you can consider it your cloud native control plane. It basically helps you provision and manage everything, all your resources. So you can take those resources, you can compose them into higher level abstractions, and then you can then expose those abstractions to your developers in order for them to be able to self-service and get the uh, infrastructure and resources that they need when they need it in, in a safe manner. So Kubernetes, uh, it is a great control plane. It does great things for containers. Basically, Crossplane comes into Kubernetes, extends it, and then teaches it how to be a great control plane for everything else beyond containers. Um, and then control planes, not a new concept. We didn't invent control planes, right? Cloud providers have been using them for years to manage their backend systems. And so now Crossplane's here to help you build your own control plane as well. So we are a CNCF project, right? This is the maintainer track talk. Uh, we you know, donated to the, the project, uh, to the CNCF, like three, four years ago or so. Um, I've said this before, but we are ready for graduation. I think we opened the proposal to graduate back in February, so it's been a few months that we've been waiting to go through the process. It's a bit of a patience, a game of patience, if you will. But the key takeaway to this slide here is just how many people are involved in the project, right? We've got thousands of people contributing to it in some way. And we have a lot of really impressive adopters of the project too. So lots of people are coming together, you know, helping each other build control planes. And we think that this project is mature, ready to graduate. And I really hope in London, we've got news to say that we have graduated by then. All right, basics about how Crossplane works. So think about all the resources and all the infrastructure out there. Let's take, for example, AWS. So there's all sorts of networking, compute, storage, all that sort of stuff there, right? Uh, Crossplane basically takes all of those resources, I think last count in AWS there's over 900 of them, basically takes all those resources and then represents them as custom resources in Kubernetes. It extends the Kubernetes API with something to represent all of those resources out there. This is what that looks like. So let's take, for instance, a S3 bucket, and then uh, you know, we can basically represent that as an object in the Kubernetes API. So just like any Kubernetes API object, you know, like a config map, a deployment, a secret, whatever, now you've got those for all of your infrastructure as well. Uh, it's a well-formed Kubernetes uh, object. So it's got you know, the API version kind, metadata spec, status, all the stuff you would expect from a Kubernetes API object but it's got all the configuration properties you need to be able to you know, configure and provision all these different types of infrastructure. In addition you know, to being able to have those spec fields to specify what you want, uh, like it's got, you know, like any well-formed Kubernetes object, it's got status and events as well. So whatever's happening out there in the real world with that infrastructure will get reflected as status and conditions and events telling the, you know, the life cycle, the history of that uh, resource in, in the Kubernetes API and on that object. Now, how does that work under the covers? So basically, let's take it from left to right. Let's take our bucket manifest, and let's say somebody applies that to the Kubernetes API server. Um, that's probably gonna be through some GitOps means is most likely how that's gonna happen. But then when that manifest comes into the API server, gets persisted to etcd, Crossbane has a bunch of controllers that are there waiting for events and ready to reconcile the desired state of that bucket. And then, uh, you know, with the actual state out there in Amazon. So the SG controller wakes up, sees the event there, goes and calls AWS API to go ahead and provision the resources um, you know, in the cloud, and then keeps that up to date and synchronized with you know, actively reconciling it over time. So if the observed state in S3, somebody goes to AWS console, uh, changes some config values or something, the S3 controller in Crossplane will notice that and correct it so that the desired state that you specified is always what's actually out there as actual state in the cloud. 
We talked about AWS a lot, but there's a bunch of extensions for cross-plane. There's you know, all the major cloud providers are supported, uh, on-premises stuff, uh, lots of different things for different environments and different types of extensions as well. So there's a whole bunch of them. There's, it's a pretty vibrant ecosystem, I would say. Um, and then there's a place to go and discover and you know, uh, start consuming them and sharing the, yours that you're making as well. Uh, you can find that in the marketplace at marketplace.upbound.io. All right, Mark, take us. Nice, thanks, Jared. Uh, so let's move on to level two of Crossplane, where we're gonna start building our control planes. This is where we're really gonna see the power of what we can achieve with Crossplane. Um, so what we're able to do is assemble all these granular resources, um, and we can build them in multiple clouds, right? GCP, AWS, Azure, on-prem, whatever you wanna do. And essentially, we're gonna be able to expose um, a higher level self-service API that your app team, security team, platform team is able to consume um, by themselves, right? So let's take, for example, a cluster. That's going to be made up of GKE, node pool, network, subnet, IAM, you name it, it'll be in there. And we can offer that as a single abstraction, just an API, right? It'll be the cluster API, let's say. And it'll take in limited config, right? Maybe name, size, region. Um, and then your developers or your platform team are able to just create a cluster following your best practices, the way that you want that cluster to be set up, right? So it's hiding a lot of that complexity of infrastructure. Um, and putting in policies and guardrails and, and, and opinions that the platform team can decide how that infrastructure is created. Again, this is with the Kubernetes API, so kubectl, GitOps, however you're deploying your apps, you can do that with Crossplane. And then the awesome thing is there's no code that's required when you want to do this. So let's take a look at what, that, what this kind of looks like. So if we start on the right side with the managed resources, that's kind of what Jared was talking about. These are, these are the you know, one-to-one -one relationships with the S3 bucket, the GKE, the node pool, whatever. And these get made up into a higher level composition. Um, on top of that, we've got the composite resource definition. So this is the XRD. This is the schema. This is what you're exposing to your developer. These are the knobs that they're allowed to change. And then finally, we've got the claim. So what does this look like? So we've got a developer. She's on the left. She's got her cross-plane popsicle. She's ready to create a database, right? She can put in two inputs, right? She puts the size, small, and the engine, Postgres. What happens behind the scenes? So the platform team has allowed those different fields to be configured. That's the XRD, right? That's the schema. Um, that's built on top of the AWS composition that's made up of an RDS instance, a DB parameter group, and a security group, right? So your developer has been able to create a database by providing two simple inputs, small and Postgres, and they get all these uh, in infrastructure created the way that you want it to be done. So what does this look like in Crossplane? So this is the XRD, the composite resource definition. For those that have used Crossplane, you know that this file can be relatively verbose and pretty long. Um, there's work that we've done to, or that we want to do to make this easier. I won't get too much into the details on this stuff. Uh, if you want to play with it, you'll see what I mean. Uh, this is the composition. So here we've got a pipeline of functions that are running, and these are going to generate the managed resources uh, that will be created in the cloud. So functions, right? That's a big thing uh, of Crossplane, and it's they're 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 now fully mature and they really, this is where they really gives you the power of doing you know, whatever you want to do, right? So you're able to run a simple pipeline of functions that will compose your resources. You can write these in the language of your choice. This is where you include your logic. Uh, this is really up to you, right? And it's a sweet spot between no code at all and building an entire controller, right? You can just focus on what your platform needs and you're able to give off that heavy lifting to cross-plane and it'll do the reconciling, the CRUD operations and all that for you. So at the bottom here, we've got an example uh, just showing how functions work. So the developers apply their claim, and then Crossplane is going to run a suite of functions, uh, essentially input to one function, and then it's going to generate output that will go into a next one function, so on and so forth. And at the end, you're going to get a list of managed resources that Crossplane is going to create in your cloud for you. So um, composition functions have actually graduated to V1 in uh, Crossplane 1.17. They're mature, they're stable, they're production ready, they're being used in production all over the place. Uh, Crossplane's all in on functions. So for those that maybe are new to Crossplane, uh, before this we had patch and transform. For those who have used Crossplane and have used patch and transform, you know that when you're trying to deal with things that maybe felt like your hands were tied behind your back, that's no longer the case, right? You can do whatever you want. So how can you start using functions, right? Uh, you don't have to write any code. Uh, the community's written an ecosystem of a bunch of reusable functions. You can write your own function if you'd like to, uh, but you can grab these functions that the community have written and you can just throw them into your compositions and just use them. Um, you also have the ability to go from the no-code, low-code, full-code spectrum 
If you want to use a high level config language, that's up to you. If you want to use a full general purpose program language, that's up to you. If you want to use both, that's also up to you. You can mix and match. So let's look at what functions look like in Crossplay. So this is Go templating. Those that built Helm charts, you're maybe familiar with this. Here we're looping around, creating access keys. This one is a KCL example. Again, we're looping around regions and we're creating EC2 instances. This one, Jared told me to put this one in. It's Q. I have no idea what it's doing, but <laughs> I think it's creating like an IM policy. I'm not really sure. The point is you can use Q if you want to. If you want to. <laughs> uh, here's Pickle creating config maps. And then here's Go creating an S3 bucket, right? This is the full code example. If you're using Go, you're comfortable with Go. You don't need to context switch between different things. You can do that. You also get all the niceties of Go, you know, your linting, your testing, and all that stuff that comes with it. All right. So we've gotten to the basics. Uh, we've laid the groundwork here, and we're going to move on to uh, some deeper content and some demos and stuff like that. And it's definitely content you all have not seen because we were working on it last night to finish it. So you haven't seen this. You mean this morning? Yeah, this morning, whatever. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about a long-standing user experience problem in Crossplane. This has been this way for multiple years, so I know folks in this room have been bitten by it and have felt the pain from it. So let's review that uh, you know, composition uh, you know, model with separation of concerns. It is amazing to give a simplified abstraction to your developers. You know, they get to create a simple claim, um, and you know, they get all this access to all this infrastructure in a safe way that you as a platform engineer have defined. Uh, it's a really strong model for self-service and, and you know, getting infra that your uh, devs need. But a problem that has been there for multiple years in Crossplane is that essentially Underneath the API, your composite resource is composing together a whole bunch of resources. Those may run into errors, they may have events, they may have status, they may have conditions. That gets surfaced to the composite resource that's underneath the API line that the developer never sees. So the developer can you know, create a claim, they want that post, small Postgres database, and then basically the experience that they get if things go wrong, most all the time the experience is not ready. The developer has no idea if it's their fault, if it's something they have control over, you know, where to go look. So they end up you know, calling the platform team, interrupting them and saying, please fix this for me. Um, so we, that's been that way for quite a while and now we've done better than that. So we're gonna jump into a demo now, something from, uh, I think this was first done in 1.17. So let's take a look here. So I, as a platform engineer, I have defined an abstraction for uh, a landing zone. For my developers, let's say they're starting up a brand new project and they need to provision all the networking and foundational infrastructure to later on deploy their services into, um, I've, I've abstracted that into this con a simple concept of a landing zone for my developers. So take for instance here, uh, this one, you know, this uh, a landing zone claim with, you know, I specify the team, the environment, what service tier, the region, et cetera. And it's a very simple experience to go ahead and uh, ask for a landing zone as a developer. So I'm going to apply that to the cluster and note I'm saying classic here. Uh, that's only, that's, that's to signify to you all that this first part of the demo is going to be the previous experience in Crossplane that was there for multiple years that is not very good. So we're starting at a not very good spot. So I've applied that to the cluster. Um, I'm a developer. I, uh, you know, I have access to just my namespace and the simple claims in it. Oh, okay, get resource. Um, oh, cool, I see ready, false. All right, that's not super informative. So let's try to get a little bit more details by looking at the JSON output, piping that to uh, JQ and looking at the status perhaps. Cool, I get more details that say it's not ready. All right, well, here we can try something more. Let's, uh, we haven't looked at events yet. So let's look at events that, that tells the story, that tells the history of this, uh, of this object, right? If there's an event, the resource isn't ready, okay? This isn't going well. Um, I'm just gonna have to call my platform team and say, hey, what's wrong with this thing? Because I don't know. It's just, it's not ready. So let's, let's, uh, let's do better than that. We can definitely do better than that. Uh, once again, I'm gonna create another landing zone object here. And uh, I'm just gonna specify a couple different parameters. You know, the, the team, this is gonna be a production environment, so hope it works. Uh, you know, we're gonna use a low service tier. Um, we'll try that now. So I'm gonna apply this manifest again, or this new manifest, the modern one. And uh, spoiler alert, this one will start by failing as well. That's uh, intended, so let's do a k-get on that. And by default, the columns that are gonna be shown are not super useful. 
but let's try to see if we can do something better than what we've shown so far. So let's look at the JSON output again. Pipe that to JQ, look at the status. Oh, awesome. A new condition, a new status condition that tells us exactly what's wrong. In this production environment, um, that, that low tier I asked for, it's not supported. Ah, and it tells me what tiers are supported. Okay, brilliant. For production, I can do critical or standard. So I'll just go back here, no low, yes, standard. Apply this thing again. And then if we take a look again at like the status conditions, instead of that, you know, your, your thing is wrong and uh, this is how to fix it. Now we've got a confirmation that hit provisioning was successful, things are good. And if we do like a, you know, just look at the regular output here, we'll see that it's ready true. So like the key takeaway here is that for years in Crossplane as a developer, I would try to use these awesome abstractions from my platform team. I wouldn't know what's going on and have to bother them. Now, the, the, the platform engineer can be very specific about, hey, this is how I'm composing resources. This is what our infrastructure means in our organization. And these are important error messages that need to get up to developers to help them, you know, help themselves, basically. And let's take a quick look at how we did this also. So I'm going to show some Go code, but the point isn't going to be like all the details of the Go code. I, you know, I implemented my own function as a platform engineer to compose together using Go all these resources, you know, like IAM accounts and, uh, you know, networking stuff and whatnot to, uh, to be able to define what a, what a, um, a landing zone is. But the important part instead here is just going to be the error handling. So take for instance here, uh, if there is an error, when, with my Go code here, I could say, yep, return a response uh, from this function here that's saying that the landing zone provisioning failed, include the error object, and here is the important part, that using the you know, Crossplane's SDK, I can say this specific error, go ahead and bump it up to the claim so that the developer sees this. You don't have to do that for all errors. You're only going to want to expose information that your developer actually cares about and can do something about. That's kind of where we, we erred on the side of hide the complexity, hide the complexity from developers, and we gave them no information. Now you know you can choose what's important to show to your developers. Final slide on this. You don't have to write code to use this functionality, once again, right? Most often you can do things in Crossplane in a declarative format. So take for example here, uh, imagine a pipeline that's composing together resources, maybe it's KCL, maybe it's Pickle, I don't know, whatever. But then you can use a helpful function that we've added for you. Uh, so you basically just say, hey, use the function status transformer. And then if there are, uh, if there are errors for the Cloud SQL instance as part of this composition, and they look like this with this error message and this error code, go ahead and take that one and bubble it up to the, uh, to the developer, to the claim, so that they can see that. So once again, you've got this granular control of what's important to show to your developer, what's important to complexity to hide away from them, and you just can do more things to help your developers help themselves. All right, Mark, you want to take over here with your laptop? Yeah. All right, there you go. All right, cool. Uh, let's move on to something else that was also improved in, uh, in Crossplane, and that was the package manager. Um, so for those that have used Crossplane and the package manager previously, you may have ran into a few problems, uh, and hopefully we've fixed most of those. So the first new API that was introduced was the image config API. This allows uh, developers, or uh, people using Crossplane to configure credentials so that you can pull images and the dependencies of those images. So you're able to now pull private package dependencies and the private packages using an image config. You're also able to pull images from multiple private registries um, so that you can, you know, get the things that you want from, uh, from wherever you need to. Uh, image config also uh, has image verification, which is an alpha in Crossplane 1.18. Uh, this essentially verifies the image signature of the package that you're pulling. Again, this is just adding to that safer supply chain uh, for, for folks using Crossplane. Um, the other big thing was dependency version upgrades. So historically, Crossplane hasn't been able to upgrade the uh, dependencies of a package. Now it can do that uh, for you. You used to have to cube cuddle edit and make a change, which is kind of weird when you want to automate everything. But anyways, that's fixed now. Um, and you can also uh, install packages using digests. Uh, previously, it was only tags, so now it supports digests. You can, again, just uh, uh, reinforce that, that secure supply chain, you know, uh, using SHAs and, and stuff like that. All right, let's take a look at what this looks like. Um, here we go. All right, so what I'm going to start with is by creating a Kubernetes secret. This is a Docker secret that's going to allow me to pull uh, images from my private uh, registry. I'm going to install a configuration, so that's going to be 
this configuration. Um, and this is, again, a private configuration that's got multiple private dependencies. Um, and I'm gonna be using the package pull secret that I just created. So let's see what happens when I apply this. Let's grab the configuration. So it installed, but the, it's healthy unknown. Let's take a look at what's going on in here. So as we can see, there's an error right here saying that it can't resolve the package dependencies, right? So these packages down here that are dependent on the package are private and uh, Crossplane isn't using the secret that I told the, the configuration to use. The only way around this is to patch the service account, uh, which you, know, you don't really wanna be doing, right? There, there must be a better way. So that's where uh, image config comes in. So let's take a look at the new world. So this is the image config API. Uh, it uses uh, prefix matching. So we're gonna match on any package that falls under this uh, prefix. And again, we're just referencing that secret that I created right here. So let's see what happens when we apply the image config. So right away we can see, oh, that's a little, we can see that there's new uh, packages being pulled in, right? Um, so we know that everything, the healthy, that might take a little while, it's installing providers and functions and so on. But we can see that the image config has now allowed Crossplane to success successfully pull the, the private dependencies uh, of this package. Um, let's look at one more thing, which is gonna be image verification. So again, I'm gonna create a new uh, Docker secret and I'm going to grab, where is this? This one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna install a provider. This is a provider AWS S3. I'm going to install this provider and I'm going to add the image config. So this image config that I'm using now is a new image config. It's using that secret that I just created. And down here we've got this verification stanza, which is gonna be using um, cosine to check that the images that we're pulling are signed by who they should be signed by. So let's go ahead and take a look at the status. And then, oh, I installed the, the, the provider first. Live demo, right? <laughs> okay, delete provider. Delete all of them. Let's delete this one. Delete that provider and then let's reinstall it. So now we can see that Crossplane has been able to successfully verify that image and uh, it's now gonna install that provider for us. Um, and we were able to guarantee that the image was signed by uh, who it should have been signed by. And then one last thing that I wanna show off is dependency upgrades. So that initial configuration that we installed was 0 0.5.0. I wanna upgrade to 0 0.6.0, right? And this is also bumping the child dependencies of this uh, configuration. So let's go ahead and apply 0 0.6. Cool, and let's look at the configurations. And then there we're able to see that this was upgraded to 0 0.6, that this child version here, you can trust me, it was on 2.5.0, it's now on 2.6.0, and Crossplane's been able to install everything. Everything should be healthy, installed, and true. Sweet, my turn again, thanks Mark. Um, I'm starting to get the see a theme in the demos that, that we've done today, in the, in like the demos we did earlier this week at Platform Engineering Day, where we're showing like things not working and the cross and thing, them getting better over time. <laughs> so at least it's going that direction yeah. as opposed to the other direction. Okay, so things are getting better in Crossplane. Uh, all right, so there is news about environment configs, composition environments that I do want to share with everybody here. Uh, some of you have already heard it, but I want to go over the implications with people. So uh, the environment config type in Crossplane, the, the, the data type and the API, has been matured in the 1.18 release last week to beta, but at the same time, the native support within compositions for that type has been removed. So the reasons for that and some background here is that the, the API wasn't quite the right shape, have some a little bit more complexity than we wanted to in the implementation, and the maintenance burden over uh, with it in the code base over time was a little bit more than we were comfortable with. So there is a, there is a lesson here and some accountability that we want to take as well, right? Uh, the reason this happened, where it caused, there's going to be a little pain in the community. The reason this happened is that we introduced environment config in alpha like two years ago. 
when you leave a feature in alpha for a long time, uh, you can you know, say all day, don't use this in production, it's alpha, don't do that. But if you have it there for two years, people are gonna do that, right? They're gonna end up in production somewhere, somehow. So there is a little bit of pain here, but there's also a lesson to learn of that we should not be leaving features in alpha for that long. If we don't intend to keep them around, we should go ahead and remove them earlier on in the life cycle, or we should mature them, invest them, and get them to beta and v1 uh, more, more quickly. So lesson learned. Uh, so in 1.18 though, going forward, the way to, like, you still can have all the functionality that you used to with environment config. No functionality has been taken away. It's just that the experience is slightly different now. Uh, so basically what you need to do is uh, use a function. Uh, so there's a function that will allow you to uh, basically um, select and find the environment configs that you need, merge them together, and then surface that data for subsequent steps in the pipeline. And we'll show you an example in the next slide. Uh, also, there's, uh, we know this is causing a little bit of pain, so we did take the effort and time to introduce automated migration tooling. So the crossplane convert command is there to basically uh, you know, take your old manifests and doing this in the a previous way and then automatically migrating them and you know, using functions and doing it the, the supported way going forward. So that does reduce the pain. You have to go through migration, but it is automated and tested. And this is what it looks like. In a pipeline, if you're using environment configs, the first step is going to be using function environment configs. And you're going to tell it to either find a specific environment config or use like select a selector with label matching or whatever to get multiple of them, merge them together. And then that function will store all the environment config data into the context of the function pipeline. So every subsequent step afterwards can use it just like they always have. So for instance, uh, function patch and transform or the go, to uh, go templating function here can just basically access and read and write to that environment config data in the context of the pipeline and, and things don't change basically. So you still have all the same functionality, but you do have to start using this new way about going about it. All right, I love our crossplane community. It's, it's what makes the project amazing, right? And so we've made some more investments recently into helping new contributors come to the project. So if you're interested in contributing in crossplane, we went ahead and wrote a specific guide about how to get started with contributing and how to, uh, how to start making your first uh, PRs or your first issues or whatever. Um, there's a QR code on the screen here that uh, I see some folks taking pictures of that basically goes to the contributing folder in the main crossplane repo. And it will be like a little guide there that tells you how to get started and you know, where to look to start contributing. There's a lot of stuff going on in the core and the functions of providers ecosystem, documentation, all that stuff. So lots and lots of things to find. Um, and then there's also you know, mentorship opportunities as well. Speaking of mentorship, we just successfully finished uh, the Linux Foundation mentorship program. Uh, we, we participated in the summer term this year. And uh, Ines did a fantastic job. Um, he focused on the validate command in the crossplane CLI. And so basically that command now can catch a whole bunch of validation issues and errors in your compositions that it wasn't able to before. So you, know, you can kind of make those higher quality earlier on in the development cycle and the, you know, live a happier life with your compositions that way. And then also you know, downloading and caching all the packages to get the schemas so that it can do validation. Um, and there's a lot of instances where that's sped up by two orders of magnitude now. So you can thank Ines, and he's in the bottom right there, for saving you some time. So thank you, Ines. Uh, he also wrote a blog post about his experience. So if, you're inter inter if people here are interested in mentorship opportunities, uh, then you can read that blog, get an idea of the experience. And we will be doing more mentorship stuff in, this, in the future again. So if you want to get involved in the project, uh, go to crossman.io. That is the, uh, the landing page for all this stuff um, where you can find you know, all the other stuff in the project. So just remember crossman.io from that. And then finally, we are, uh, you know, as we mentioned, we're pretty thick into the graduation process now, and it is never too late to share your story. So if you're successfully using Crossplane and you want to share your story with us, go to the adopters file in the main Crossplane repo, and, uh, and you, know, you can update it there to share your story with us. And I think that's all we've got. Thanks, everybody. So I think there's a couple minutes for questions and there's a microphone in the aisles there if you want hit to hit the microphone in there and, and ask that for the whole room to hear. Um, most of the providers or functions, whatever you call it, are targeted towards you know, AWS or expensive vSphere. Is there anything that you are targeting for, let's say, Hyper-V or Proxmox? Uh, yeah, the, the, the provider ecosystem in Crossplane is, is pretty, pretty broad. There's a whole bunch of providers out there with you know, other, other environments and other you know, software vendors and stuff like, like you're referring to there. Uh, and so like, uh, 
you know, some of those might not get as much development attention as other ones, but like the community constantly has needs for providers like that, starts them, it solves them, and kind of rallies people around them. So there's lots of those that, that are springing up all the time. And you know, I think I've, I've heard of some of them that are available for those specifically also too. So if you need help finding them, you, know, you can always go to that marketplace that I was talking so about. I did, I did a quick search uh, on my phone. Both of them are not there. Yeah, did you, and another place to check is the Crosspane Contrib organization on GitHub. And there's a bunch of them there as well. Okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And feel thank free to ping me too if you ever want to to ask a question. All right, thank you. Yeah, sweet. Uh, I have a quick question. So I know people use CAPI for managing Kubernetes cluster, but is there a scenario where people have used Crossplane for managing Kubernetes clusters? Like the internals inside the Kubernetes cluster? Operations, pretty much. Yeah, well, you, you Setting up clusters. You run a lot of platforms, Mark. Yeah. You yeah, that? So, so uh, we've got uh, provider Kubernetes, provider Helm, which allow you to talk to the Kubernetes API. Uh, so if you want to install Argo CD, ESO, Vault, whatever you want to do, you can do that with Crossplane, and you can manage that. In terms of even bringing up a new cluster? Uh, if it's not like a managed, like EKS or GKE, then you're gonna need an API that, you, that you're gonna have to talk to so that you can create that cluster. Um, there is you know, the potential of having provider CAPI or something like that where Crossplane can call that and manage that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Is this one on two? Oh, yeah, it is. Uh, what aspects of CRDs and conversely open API v3 specifications wasn't sufficient for your use cases that necessitated doing XRDs versus CRDs? Like, why do that? Why not just use CRDs? Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, I mean, basically, the, um, the, the XRDs are, they, they end up introducing CRDs into the cluster, right? So that's kind of uh, like a, it's an opinionated form of a CRD for a cross planes objects model for infrastructure and stuff like that. So it's kind of, you get like, you have a very similar experience there. And then cross plane has to, you know, dynamically create those CRDs for you based on like the, you know, abstraction that you want to, that you've defined using that XRD. Is it, why not just use CRDs for that? Like why call it XRDs? Is it just because it's like more of a parent object or? That's, that's the one thing I didn't quite understand. Yeah, so, so there's a couple extra things in Crossplane that's it's not just a CRD, right? You have to link it, like, at, at runtime, it gets linked to other compositions and, you know, having, like, multiple runtimes, it's like, uh, runtime implementations there. And then, like, you know, versioning of them uh, works a little bit differently as well. So it's, it's a slightly different object. There's okay. a lot of overlap, but it's slightly different. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good question. Uh, uh, question for you. So I was looking in the marketplace and saw that uh, Terraform was a provider. Um, how do you guys position Crossplane versus like Terraform? Um, you know, if that's being used traditionally to manage, you know, cloud resources, but then Crossplane can do the same thing. Like, where do you guys see the overlap, or, or possibly, you know, is one replacement for the other? Do they complement each other? Yeah, you want to take that, Mark? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, you, you can do pretty much everything you can do with Terraform with Crossplane. Uh, you can also manage Terraform with Crossplane. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. I think the way that I like to think about it is. When you go to create an EC2, is there someone at AWS who's running Terraform Apply, right? They're not, right? There's an API that's doing that. Uh, if that's triggering Terraform, if that's triggering a script, if that's triggering something else, th that's fine, right? So Crossplane can really be that layer on top of that. If it's Terraform behind the scenes, if you, that's what you want to do, that's what you can do. If it's something else, you can also do that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a similar question. Uh, have you seen organizations be able to reduce their reliance on Terraform or completely remove it with Crossplane? Yeah, significantly for sure. Like, uh, for you, like you, you typically see that in a phased approach, right? And that's something that provider Terraform helps with, where you know you can take one of your existing Terraform workspaces, drop it into Crossplane's provider Terraform, and it just starts reconciling it right away. So that's kind of like an easy on ramp of using your existing Terraform investments. But then over time, we we drastic, we, see, we that's pretty much what we do see is that you know more and more infrastructure gets migrated onboarded into Crossplane. One really interesting thing that I've seen people do successfully multiple times is that uh, if we think again about the concept of compositions and the abstractions that you can put on top, oftentimes what people do is like you kind of you know take something you've gotten to uh, you know Terraform, put it into something with provider Terraform, put an abstraction on top of it, and then over time you know your developers only see that abstraction. So when you're changing things underneath the covers to change over to using crossplane native approach instead of uh, you know provider Terraform, your developers are completely unaffected because they're still using that same abstraction. Yeah, my thought process was like use the 80-20 rule and go for all the low hanging fruit first, and then go for more advanced use cases yeah. with cross -plane. That is not unreasonable at all. Cool, thank you guys. Yeah.
Yeah, I think we got one more minute here. We're done at 12:30. But and then just quick note: we're like the booth opens in the CNCF Projects Pavilion down there. The crossplane booth opens at 12:30, so we'll just go right downstairs and we can hang out more down there. This is another quick follow-up to Terraform, but do you have any community resources or maybe an adoption path for those of us who are very committed to Terraform right now? Like in terms of like wanting to like, contribute or? No, no, actually it switched from basically uh, Terraform to mostly managing via Crossplane. Yeah, yeah, so in addition to, you know, being able to use provider Terraform with your existing investments there, uh, there's like, there's an import story as well. Okay. Uh, so you can take, you know, like, who, who, it doesn't, maybe it was Terraform, maybe it was something else that provisioned resources in the cloud. You can then Im import those into Crossplane and just start having it take over the management of them. And you can do that kind of a phase thing, like start with an observed only, read only type of thing to make sure that, hey, I trust this Crossplane thing. And then move over to, you know, being able to do right operations also. So, it, you know, fully manages it. So that there's, there's that way as well. There are some improvements I think that can be made to import because it's not super, super streamlined and smooth, but I think that an investment, that's an investment that we want to continue making. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. So, that's where we're, so we're totally out of time now, uh, so we're going to go ahead and head downstairs to the Project Pavilion, but thanks a lot, everyone. We really appreciate you all.